Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you this morning. It was good to be with you last week on Christmas Eve uh, and spend uh, the holidays here at what we call our family home base. So South Africa is home. Uh, Then we have a ministry home base, which is in Lansdale, Pennsylvania, just outside of Philadelphia. And then we have a family home base, which which is actually here. So we're delighted to be with you. Uh, here this morning. If you don't uh, know who I am or who we are as a family, I'm George, George Kuhn, uh, son of the elder George Kuhn, who was your interim pastor for a little while um, back a few years ago, and uh, he sends his greetings as always. My, my wife is here with me, Amy. Uh, I'll not make her stand as I usually do because then I'm in trouble the rest of the day, so... I'm just going to, you know who she is, most of you know who she is, and then we're very delighted to have our two daughters with us and our son-in-law, Louis. A little later this morning, Louis is going to come up and give a 45-minute lecture on, uh, because he is South African, so he's going to give a lecture on South African politics and economics and clear up any, you know, questions you might have on that. So he was talking about our display table in the in the foyer there, and he said, well, you have me, you know, I'm, I'm actually South African, so maybe we'll just stand him by the table, and you can ask him anything that you want to ask him after the service this morning. All right, so the agenda for today is just to sort of get everything in. We want to provide a ministry update, as well as somewhat of an introduction to our ministry for those who might not be familiar with us and what we do in South Africa. So we're going to show a video Uh, in just a moment. After the video, I'll come and just give a a very current update, answering some of the common questions we've received. We won't take questions from the audience this morning just because of the format, but I'll answer some of the common ones that we get asked all the time, and then I'll list a few prayer requests uh, that I could leave with you for those of you who have been upholding us in prayer, uh, which I know as many of you in this building. We thank you so much for that. And I'll list some specific prayer requests that you could take with you uh, on our behalf into the new year. And then I just want to open God's Word with you and encourage you as sort of a last sermon of 2023 uh, to motivate us all to be about God's mission in this world. So that'll be the agenda for this morning, and I promise you, we will be all done with that by or before 12 o'clock, okay? I, I know you're busy, you have stuff to do, we all need to take long naps this afternoon if we're going to come back and stay here till midnight tonight, right? Uh, I don't know if we're staying till midnight, I just have heard rumors that sometimes that happens, so I want to give you as much time as you can to enjoy family and friends and preparations for the events of the holiday. All right, Cody, go ahead and show the video and then I'll come up after that. We are George and Amy Coon, missionaries to Nisna, South Africa, sent by Calvary Baptist Church of Lansdale, Pennsylvania. We have been serving in Nisna and the Garden Route since August of 2017. Our family has experienced some big changes since we first arrived. George David met Sarah while she was on a three-week missions trip in the nearby town of George. After she returned to the U.S., they began texting and talking on the phone, and after a a two-and-a-half-year long-distance relationship, they were married in September of 2021. They live in Virginia, where George David works in accounting for a logistics company, and Sarah is a kindergarten teacher's aide. During our first year in South Africa, Ashley met Louie at a Bible study for young adults. They began dating after she finished high school, and they endured a long-distance relationship when she was in the U.S. for college for almost three years. Ashley returned to South Africa after college, and she and Louis were married in June of 2022. Louis is a pilot, and Ashley is a teacher at a Christian mission school, and we enjoy getting to see them every few weeks. Alyssa attended Nisna High School the four years she lived here, and she had several opportunities to share her faith with her teachers and classmates. She excelled academically and received several awards as top student. She returned to the U.S. in 2021 and is in her second year of college. While we miss Alyssa, George David, and Sarah, we are so thankful all our children love the Lord and are serving Him where He has them. Since the beginning of our time in Nisna, we have maintained three focus areas of ministry, theological education, church planting, and community service. 
I serve as the director of the Biblical Leadership Institute. We provide formal training for those in and training for local church ministry. Since our beginning in March of 2018, we have offered dozens of classes in Nisna, Sedgefield, and George. We have seen several students take classes for credit to be put toward an accredited degree in the future. Thus far, the Biblical Leadership Institute has proven effective in equipping church leaders to reach their world for Christ. Our second area of focus, church planting, has been most exciting as God has taken a small midweek Bible study group and has grown us into Nisna West Bible Church. We formally began Sunday morning services in early 2019, then we were established as a local church in March of 2021. We are both heavily involved in the church ministry where I lead worship, occasionally preach, lead our weekly follow-up time, and assist in other areas as needed. Amy does much of the church administration, coordinating the Sunday school program and coordinating all the music for the worship services. Presently, we are taking our congregation through a membership process as we seek to further formalize our structure and continue on the path of discipleship with them. Connected to the ministry of the church is our Teen Boys Bible Study. This has become a great outlet for ministry, and we have seen some of these young men profess saving faith in Christ and follow the Lord in believers' baptism. My primary outlet for community service is teaching for Launch Workplace Readiness, a ministry of Nisna Hope that equips learners with marketable skills, preparing them for upward mobility in the workplace while also teaching biblical principles for life and business. Launch began in 2018 with 10 donated laptops, and we ran two computer classes, one with 10 students and one with nine students. The computer classes meet once a week for a two and a half hour lesson for 12 weeks. Currently, we offer beginning computer, advanced computer, touch typing, personal finance, and basic customer service. Mm -hmm. During the break time for each class, students are required to attend a Bible lesson. We have students whose lives have been changed because they began living what they were taught in the Bible lessons. We also have several former students who are currently attending local Bible teaching churches as a result of hearing the Bible lessons. At the end of each 12-week course, we hold a graduation ceremony for the students. We have caps and gowns, many of which have been donated, which the students get to wear, and we celebrate their finishing the course. Many of our students have never worn a cap and gown, so graduation is a special day for them. To date, we have had 563 people successfully complete a course. We are thankful that as our program has grown, we have been able to add another teacher who started as a student in our computer classes. We praise the Lord for the good things happening as a result of the launch ministry. Considering all the Lord has done during our first six years on the field, we are grateful and humbled. We serve a glorious Savior who opens doors of ministry before us, who enables us to do his work, and who graciously allows us to observe the spiritual fruit of our labors. We count it a privilege to serve, and we look forward to many more years in Nisna for the glory of God and the exaltation of Jesus Christ. Do a little update of where we are. Uh, the first half of the video really focuses on the family updates, which I know many of you would be interested in as you've met our children and have known our children over many years now. And so everyone seems to be doing okay, and we're glad to have them with us. Last week we had all seven of us together, uh, the five of us plus the two spouses, so that was very special. We don't get to do that very often, uh, once every uh, few years or so. All right, some common questions that have been asked uh, to us is what is, the, what is the political and economic climate like in South Africa? Because I know every now and then South Africa makes the news worldwide and it's never good. Um, I can assure you that we are fine, okay? Uh, everything you see in the media about what's going on in South Africa, it's probably true, but it's probably never quite as dire as it may appear. Uh, we happen to live in an area, uh, by God's grace, that is actually quite safe, and we live in a town that is, <clears throat> you still have to lock your doors, um, you can't do like some of you do around here, where you leave the keys in the car and just, and just sort of, you know, leave the house unlocked all the time and everything else, we can't quite do that, 
uh, but it's a pretty safe place to be. We live in the Western Cape, which is by far uh, the best of the nine provinces in South Africa, and so we feel, we, we feel quite safe. Not complacently safe, but we feel safe. We have an alarm system on our house with beams inside and outside. We have bars on the windows. We have gates on our doors, which sounds like a lot, but it's pretty normal. It's pretty standard. It's pretty average uh, for, for South Africa, and it's, it's even better than average. Um, in terms of the political climate, uh, South Africa is, is definitely um, going through a lot, of, a lot of change and a lot of struggle. Um, as is the case in many countries around the world, there is a, a good dose of governmental corruption uh, at the top, and that tends to trickle down into other areas and affect the economy and affect the people in certain ways. But uh, we've been back in the States since, uh, since October 3rd, and I don't think we've gone more than two or three days without hearing about government corruption here. So it's really the same wherever you go. Uh, it is not any better or worse here than it is over there. Uh, so we're affected by that uh, from time to time. Most notably, uh, we experience what they call load shedding, which is planned power outages as well as the occasional unplanned one or two or five a week or whatever it might be. And so just, just before we left uh, to come here in October to come to the States, we were actually in a pretty good position where we were only experiencing about two to four hours of power outages uh, per day. Um, and then just a few weeks ago, we had slowly gotten back up to what they call stage six out of eight. Stage eight is the apocalypse, I think, but stage six uh, is where you have up to um, anywhere between eight to 11 or so hours a day of no electricity. And this isn't because we don't have it, it's because there's a lot of corruption with it, and we're selling a large percentage of it to other countries and putting our own people in uh, difficult positions. But we manage, we know when the outages are coming, at least most of the time we do, and we just plan our days around that um, because a lot of those outages happen either just before, during, or just after when you would normally have dinner. We've eaten a lot of salads and, and other things where you don't need to cook, which is actually something that we can use. So it's kind of a blessing if you look at it that way. Um, we are working to uh, raise, not raise money, but we're saving money, and uh, some friends of ours have been very generous to us just even in the last three months and have really helped us uh, with some funds specifically designated for a battery solar backup system. Um, there's options with generators that are cheaper, but they're less reliable and difficult and noisy and fumey and offensive to neighbors and all those kinds of things. And so we're looking at a, at a fairly upscaled, upmarket backup system that will allow us to stay on at all times. But that's pretty expensive. But it'll get us pretty much off the grid, which is what I think w w where we need to be <laughs> in many ways. You may need to be that way here too someday. You never know. It, it might be coming. But that's where we feel like we're heading. But we're fine in, in those areas. We're okay. Um, in terms of an, another common question is just uh, about the ministry, like what are your opportunities? How is the religious freedom over there? How is the responsiveness of the people? What's going on in terms of either other religions or religious oppression and, and so on and so forth? I will say that in some ways, not in every way, but in some ways, there is more freedom of religion in South Africa than there is in the United States. And it's not even close. And the example that I'll use is we as a team, I personally and Amy personally, we are not so much involved in this part of our team ministry, but several of our teammates have the opportunity to be in public government schools. Okay, hear me when I say that. Public government schools giving Bible lessons on a weekly basis, telling missionary stories, Bible stories, giving the gospel to children, and inviting them to receive Christ. 
in both primary schools and even some of our high schools. It is very open. Some of you may have seen, this is going back a couple of years, <clears throat> but some of you may have seen our daughter Alyssa's valedictory speech that she gave as top student in her graduating class, where she gave the gospel in English and Afrikaans together in one speech. You try that in America, especially in a state like New York, and you'll be dragged off the stage. And you'll be considered offensive and oppressive and a menace to society. In South Africa, it's very welcome. It's very welcome. Now, that, that, that doesn't mean everybody's just falling on their knees and getting saved all the time either. It just means that culturally, as much as they are a socialist, communist, wannabe country in some ways, they are very open to the gospel. And so while the political system and structure doesn't necessarily reflect what you might be used to around here, there's lots of freedom, and there's lots of openness, and there's lots of receptivity. As I said, some of that is cultural, so it's a, more of a surface-level acceptance. Uh, it's not as if everybody in these governmental uh, institutions and arenas as a born-again believer. That's not the case. And yet there's a lot of freedom there, even if they would consider themselves a social democracy. Um, and certainly some of the leadership going back to the mid-1990s would have identified very strongly with communist parties over the years. So we live in a, in a very exciting place, and we really enjoy what we're doing there. We serve on the field with a great group of teammates who are all variously gifted and differently motivated and differently challenged in, in, in certain niches of the culture. So some, as I said, are involved heavily in schools and, and getting into schools either through music education, drama, or just volunteering to help. Uh, Amy is heavily involved in the computer skills training arm of our Nisena Hope ministry, and uh, if you have specific questions about that and what she does, she would be happy to answer those for you. Uh, she has had a wonderful impact in our community, not just upskilling people in computer training, but then through that ministry, uh, allowing people to be exposed to the gospel on a regular basis. So we have lots of opportunities, lots of open doors. Others of us on the team are more traditional church planters, just pastors who've decided to take their set of gifts and their training and their uh, experience overseas and establish New Testament uh, biblically-based local churches throughout the garden route of South Africa. Then there's very strange people like myself who are more trained in theological education. I'm, I'm more of the professor of the group. And so it's my job to wake up every day thinking about how can we uh, equip national pastors and other church leaders to do the ministry for themselves. So I'm constantly looking to replace myself, whether it's in teaching, preaching, other church ministry. Look, I'm almost 50. I'm male and I'm white, so I'm going to be canceled soon, all right? So, you know, that's just how it works in our culture today. So I'm definitely out of style and, and you know, out of what is in today, so I need to replace myself as quickly as I can. So that's my job. My job is to try to see how we can hand these ministries over to South Africans, not irresponsibly, not too quickly but in a way that intentionally puts them in position to lead the ministries that they're already capable of leading, but they just need some training. The Biblical Leadership Institute, which is my main uh, outlet for theological education, uh, right now it is primarily focused on adult education. In other words, second career type people. We are not uh, taking students at the moment right out of high school and plugging them into a bachelor's degree kind of program that you would see here in the States. We are, however, in January of 2025, our plan is to start uh, a program of that nature. So transitioning now from a more recent update to a series of prayer requests, number one, you can pray for the foundations 
Theological Institute, which will parallel the Biblical Leadership Institute. We love naming stuff um, over there. So uh, the Biblical Leadership Institute, we only teach on Saturday mornings. We only meet every other Saturday. We do teach in three locations, so I'm quite busy on the weekends, whether I'm teaching, which I do a lot of, or whether I'm facilitating or just assisting others or administrating the program. That's really an adult continuing ed kind of training ministry, but we have seen a need as a team to begin to take some of these uh, young people out of high school, and not that all of them will go into full-time Christian ministry, but in this gap year, you know how people take a gap year nowadays? Uh, that's very popular in South Africa as well because the access to tertiary education is not that great. And so a lot of people do find themselves having a year between high school and university to wait for the openings and the availability for education that they seek. And so why not take advantage of that time and get them connected to our local churches and give them a year, just one year, as the program grows, we'll probably expand it to a two-year program, and maybe someday when I'm about ready to retire, we'll be ready to, to institute a four-year program. But right now, for 2025, we're looking to start small with just young men. Uh, we don't have the facility space for young women as of yet. We are working on that. Hopefully, I can bring you an update on that soon uh, in the first half of 2024. But the goal at this moment is January 2025 to launch the Foundations Theological Institute, a one-year gap year program for a group of young men. We don't know who they are yet, who God is going to bring, uh, but this will be a residential, on-site, 24-7 for about 10 and a half months, from about late January to uh, early to mid-December. We want to house them. Uh, we'll have to feed them somehow. Thankfully, that part of it's not dependent on me. They would all starve. Um, and then we give them biblical classes, theological classes, and then even some practical ministry involvement as well as training. So please pray for that um, as, we, as we seek to launch that program in 2025. Uh, prayer request number two, please pray for our local church, Nisna West Bible Church. We are growing uh, we have a strong group of people. We're averaging around 50 people a week. And up until just a week ago, we were meeting in a home, which was tough. I, not many living rooms hold 50 people nicely. Um, and so we've been praying about facility space and what God would have for us for quite a long time. If you've been reading our email updates, and I know some of you get them, we, we have been praying about that for a long time, and God just has not, for whatever reason, I don't know, uh, I can't say I'm thrilled with this, but, y you know, how do you take your frustrations to God when God is part of your frustration? I don't know, but, but uh, I keep saying, Lord, would you just give us some direction here? We have some possibilities in the pipeline. None of them are immediate solutions, but we need a facility solution badly. Uh, last week, Christmas Eve, we met for the first time in another in, in one of our teammates who's not connected with our church plant. He's connected with another church plant, but in his house, he has a spare garage that can seat up to about 70. So he very graciously, uh, he and his family have opened that space up to us, and it works really nicely until they rent out their cottage, which is attached to their home, to paying guests, which they need to do, then we get a little bit bumped. So last week, they had this amazing Christmas Eve service, no problems, no issues. I saw a text last night warning that, oh, the space we normally use for part of the morning is not available because there's paying customers in to rent, so now we have to shift again. And I can already see, this is not a sustainable solution. It'll work for a while. But we really need the Lord to show us what he would have us do. And trust me, when he does, I'll let you know, because we're going to need help. <laughs> okay, so I will let you know. Uh, don't worry about that. I will not keep our supporters out of the loop. Trust me. Uh, you'll know very, very soon where the Lord is leading and what he's going to have us do. So that would be prayer request number two. Prayer request number three, please continue to pray for Amy's ministry in the launch computer training specifically 
Uh, if you want to be more specific about it, please pray for the students who come for counseling. We have offered free biblical counseling to any of our computer students, and several of them have taken advantage of it. And it's been great. But our schedule, if we allow it, it can become dominated by these counseling needs. And that's fine because those are opportunities for the gospel. But wow, do we need wisdom in that area of ministry. Uh, that can very easily sort of overwhelm everything else. And we need to have the balance to be able to, I, I personally need to be able to focus on theological education and church planting, and then some of that biblical counseling that we do, but we need as a team to have a lot of discernment in that. We've noticed over the years that some come for help, and you sort of get the feeling after several meetings that they're just there maybe for a handout, or maybe for financial assistance, or food assistance, or something like that. Maybe they're trying to take advantage of you, and yet you don't want to become too cynical and too jaded, uh, where you start suspecting everybody of being a beggar. Um, so we need just we need a lot of wisdom and discernment as people come for the computer skills training, and their lives are genuinely touched by the Holy Spirit leading them either to Christ or in Christ. Um, we need discernment on how best to shepherd them uh, as we go along because it can be all-consuming. So those would be the top three things. I have one praise to share with you. Uh, you may or may not know this, but um, a couple of updates ago, we wrote a letter explaining that um, we, had, we had lost a particular individual donor. He, he didn't die, but we just he, he, he sort of aged out of being able to give but he was responsible for 12000 a year uh, just as an individual. So that was a big one for us. And obviously, when a lot of your support depends upon individuals like ours does, it's about half individuals, half churches. Um, when you lose a big one like that, that's, that's tough. Um, I'm happy to report that as of two days ago, we have closed that full gap of 1000 a month just on this trip alone. God has been so gracious to us. Our support is back up to 100%. You all are a big part of that, and we thank you so much for that. But financially, uh, we're fine. We have been able to add a couple of individuals. We've added a couple new churches. Um, a couple of people have increased their giving, formally have increased their giving. And the end result is, is that as of December 29, our goal of closing the 1000 a month gap has been uh, filled. Now, some of those uh, donations, some of that support is not uh, available until January. And so we're just praying that people follow through on their promises, <laughs> right? So sometimes you come and people get excited and they're like, we're going to support you. And this is how much and this is when we're going to start. I've had that happen a lot. And then the time comes for them to start and you get ghosted. Is that the right use of the term? Alyssa, is that... Is that the right use? I, I don't know. I, I, like I said, I'm canceled. I'm, I'm, I'm too old. I'm the wrong everything, and I don't know what the right terms are, but just pray. As long as we don't get ghosted, okay, uh, this, uh, th this upcoming month, we should be fine. But I'm not surprised at that. The Lord has taken care of us so well over the past six, almost six and a half years now that we've been on the field, and we appreciate your support in that. All right, quickly, if you'll turn with me to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. I just want to share with you one of the more encouraging aspects of missions that I see in all of Scripture. And the book of Revelation is not really a book that we often associate with missions, but I believe that missions is everywhere in the last book of the Bible. There are multiple instances in the book of Revelation where a particular phrase or a particular series of phrases is used. And these phrases collectively point us to the success, the guaranteed success of missions, the guaranteed success of gospel ministry. Now in Revelation 5, we have just come out of, in chapter 4, where John sees a vision of praise to the Creator. Now, I believe if you look at Revelation chapter 4 and compare it to Ezekiel 1 and Isaiah 6, you're going to see 
largely the same kinds of descriptions. Ezekiel goes into all kinds of very strange detail that's nowhere else in the Scriptures. But particularly Isaiah 6 and Isaiah's vision and his sort of call to ministry, it looks a lot like what John sees in Revelation 4. And I believe Revelation 4 is a picture of something that is ongoing past, present, and future in the so-called throne room of heaven. Revelation, Revelation chapter 4 has the seraphim flying around crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And there's this majestic scene of praise. And I believe that has been going on from the beginning. I believe it's happening now. I believe Revelation 4 is something that is happening now. Not, not specifically John's vision, but if we were to get a view of what's going on in heaven, or the throne room of heaven, as you might say, as many commentators label the, these two chapters, 4 and 5. I believe this is what's happening now, and I believe it goes on. I believe it goes on forever. But Revelation 5 is different. Revelation 5, the scene doesn't shift. We're, we're still in the throne room of heaven. We're still in the midst of this universal praise of the Creator, but now another figure enters the scene, and it's the worthy Lamb of God. We know Him as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And God is ready to unleash His end-time judgments upon the world. And John is a little worried because there is nobody found who is worthy to actually open the scroll and unleash the judgments. And those judgments start in chapter 6, and they are apocalyptic and cataclysmic indeed. But who's going to do this? The Creator could do it directly, but God as Creator has always used mediaries to, to, un, to undertake His work. Whether it's prophets, prophets and proclaiming His Word, whether it's priests and offering sacrifice, whether it's vice regents or kings who God has commissioned to reign on the earth, he accomplishes his work through another. And as John looks around at the beginning of chapter 5, you can skim through it as I describe it to you, he's, he's upset, he's sad, he's distressed because no one is worthy to open this scroll. Now we know from the beginning of chapter 6 that this scroll that is sealed with seven seals, is the unfolding of the judgment of God. And no one is worthy to do it. And then comes along Jesus. And how he's portrayed at the beginning of chapter 5 is that he is a lamb who is slain. Look with me at verse 6. Between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain, with seven horns, with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went, and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So this is the scene, and I'll get to the point in verses 9 and 10 in just a moment. So... Here's the lamb, the worthy lamb, the slain and yet resurrected and glorified lamb of God, coming into this space occupied by the Creator, who is omnipresent and yet is pictured here as in a particular space, seated on the heavenly throne. And the worthy lamb comes, and the worthy lamb is described with these symbols that speak to his omniscience, that speak to his authority, that speak to his um, empowerment by the Holy Spirit of God, the reference to the sevenfold Spirit of God, or in my translation, the seven spirits of God, is an allusion to Isaiah 11 verse 1, where the Spirit of the Lord is described in a sevenfold fashion. There are not seven Holy Spirits, it's the sevenfold Spirit. The number seven, of course, being the sign and the symbol of completion and perfection. So the worthy Lamb of God comes before the Father, before the Creator, and He takes the scroll, 
In all of his majesty and glory, he takes the scroll from the hand of him who is seated on the throne. And when he does this, those attendees in heaven fall down and worship the Lord. What a majestic scene that inaugurates the end time judgments upon the earth. Now, I'm going to let Pastor Jamie sort out for you all of the meaning of all of the terms of the book of Revelation, okay? That's his job. Thank the Lord. That is not my job, okay? (laughs) I'm going to leave that to him. He can walk you through that someday at some point. If he hasn't already, maybe he will someday. I don't know. But I'll leave that to him to explain everything here. And the reason I say that is in verse 8, there is mentioned the 24 elders. And there's a lot of back and forth about who the 24 elders are. And I'll just say this without trying to uh, sort of pinpoint an eschatological position upon you. I'll leave that to your pastor. The 24 elders could mean a number of different things, but it cannot mean less than the redeemed saints the people of God. Now, however you want to suss out what the people of God is, who they are, whether it's Israel and the church, whether the 24 elders represent the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles, which which could be likely, or whether it's just a symbol of the church, or whether it's a symbol of just redeemed people, saved people before the throne. However you want to parse that out, I'll leave that for a later time but it does not mean less than those who have been redeemed. And I know that to be a fact because of verses 9 and 10. And this is really the point of the message this morning. Verse 9, they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Friends, again, however you parse out what the 24 elders are and what they mean, I believe that in Revelation 5, this is us. We are worshiping the worthy Lamb. This is a yet future event. Chapter 4, this is ongoing now. Chapter 5 is yet to come. John gets to see it in a visionary form. He gets to prophesy about it. He gets to describe it to us, and I believe encourage us and and assure us with it. But friends, I'm telling you, Revelation 5 is a look not to the future, but our future. If you are redeemed, if you are born again, if you have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. This is our future. And the Bible tells us that we fall down before the Lord and we praise the worthy Lamb for His redemption of people out of every tribe, out of every nation, out of every language, and out of every people. Friends, this guarantees that the mission's plan of God ultimately succeeds. It ultimately succeeds. It cannot fail because John gives us a vision into its completion. Now, that doesn't mean everything we do in South Africa is wildly successful. We've tried some dumb things. I'm not going to tell you what they are. You can ask me later if you want to know. We've had some things not go so well. We've had people reject our message. We've had people take offense to whatever it is that we're doing in ministry. But ultimately, being involved in missions is a guaranteed successful endeavor. It's kind of like having a retirement account that you know will earn 10% interest a year compounded from now until you're 110 years old. Wouldn't that be cool? (laughs) To just know that the success is guaranteed. Wouldn't you want to get involved in something like that? Yeah, you probably would. 
Well, this is far greater than any kind of success you could be guaranteed in an earthly, material, physical sense. This is a picture of the guaranteed success of the mission of God in His world. That's it. And my point for you this morning is just to encourage you as we bring this year to a close. Friends, you are helping us in another nation to another people but you yourselves are involved in this right here, in this town, in this county, in this region of New York State. You are involved in this. Now, the question isn't whether or not you're a participant in the missional program of God, because you are. If you claim the name of Jesus Christ, you're already on the team. The question is, are you living in light of, are you living in a way that feeds into, that helps, that is a clear uh, participation in the plan of God, or are you just sitting on the sideline just waiting for the end? My challenge to you this morning, friends, is to realize that you are part of this process. To believe that this process is guaranteed to be successful and to motivate you to participate in the process in whatever way God allows and gives you opportunity to participate in it. For some of you, that's giving the gospel to your unsaved friends and family on a regular basis because you're surrounded by them. For others of you, it may involve a more subtle, a more behind-the-scenes, understated testimony that you live in before others, and you wait for those opportunities to maybe share a word about the Lord and about your faith in Him and about what God has done for you. Some of you are extremely gifted in the giving and the praying and the support and the uplifting, and you do battle on your knees every day for those who are active in God's kingdom work. Whatever it is and however it is, that you have been equipped to be part of God's program of missions in this world, please dedicate yourselves afresh to that mission in the coming year, will you? It's guaranteed successful, okay? It's not going to fail as a whole. You may be faithful, you may be unfaithful, but God's moving ahead with His program. Why wouldn't you want to be a part of that? if you truly believe in Him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You so much for Your Word. Lord, it challenges us, it, it rebukes us, it encourages us, Lord. And I do pray, above everything else, that You would take this Scripture text of the morning and that You would encourage us with it and convict us and motivate us to do Your work in Your way for Your glory. In Christ's name, amen.